Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Are you a new or sophisticated investor wanting to learn how to operate a successful syndication business? For life-changing training from the nation's leading syndication expert, my friend Vinny Chopra has the training you need. Text LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, to 474747. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Amy Wan. Thanks for being on the show again, Amy. Thank you for having me. If you've been listening to the show for long at all, you've heard Amy's name before. I hope you have. She's, she's been very generous with her time and, and her knowledge and, and has helped us with many episodes covering many topics in the syndication business uh, that you need to listen to if you're in this business. It's very important. Uh, but a little more about her. She's the founder and CEO of Bootstrap Legal, which uses artificial intelligence to help draft real estate syndication legal documents faster and cheaper. She has authored LexisNexis, a private equity practice guide. I was named one of 10 women to watch in legal technology by the American Bar Association Journal in 2014 and one of 18 millennials changing legal tech by law.com in 2018. Amy, thank you again uh, so much for your time. I, I'm always honored to have you on the show. And uh, you know these topics, uh, especially today's topic, if you're listening to this, like you are wondering about this right now. I know you are if you're in this business. And, and it's, it's such a hot topic. I get calls about this numerous times a week. And I know Amy does too. And, and so uh, it's just, everybody's talking about, about it now. Numerous masterminds that I'm a part of have been talking about it and just calls all the time. And so, and, and that topic um, is raising capital and what that should look like when you're partnering with, with other operators and just what that should, how that should, should be structured, how it should not be structured. And Amy's going to help us understand that a little bit today. But uh, Amy, thank you again. Uh, give us a little bit about maybe an update about what's happening with you or, or your business and let's dive right in. Yeah. I mean, Bootstrap Legal is going well. You know, we have had uh, many clients come through since we opened our doors in 2017. So everything's great. Um, the reason I wanted to, or, or, you know, the topic I want to talk about on the show today is capital raising. And I, I'm aware that Mauricio did an episode on your show, you know, uh, more than a, a couple of shows ago, um, talking about this topic and, you know, I, I want to make sure that we don't just, um, you know, do the basics that we, we really talk about what's going on in, in the industry today, because um, it's kind of gotten to a, a strange inflection point, I think. Um, you know, when I started in real estate syndication early on, you know, there were definitely people going around raising capital, but not nearly as many today and not doing it the way they are today. Um, and I think it's just gotten to this really crazy bubble in this la in the last maybe 12 to 18 months. There's just a lot of questionable activity going around. And so it's, it's, I think right now it's, it's, it's time to really publicly talk about this. Um, you know, things I've seen from my side is, you know, um, influencers or, 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 you know, real estate syndication marketers taking acquisition fees or asset management fees paying those out to capital raisers. Um, you know, this, this new thing that I find very su suspect, this deferred equity structure where it's, you know, oh, I'm a part of the GP, but I'm not really in the GP. My, my name isn't on any of the investor decks or the PPM, and their slice of the GP is dependent on how much is raised. Um, there's also been a practice of just, you know, I've got a deal. I'm going to let anyone go raise capital for this deal. Um, and so that results in investors getting the same deal from multiple people who really are not the sponsor, right? And so investors are left questioning like, well, who is the actual sponsor? This is very strange. Um, I don't know. Have you, have you seen other things that I haven't mentioned, Whitney? Now, I've, I've seen many of those things you just <laughs> said. And, and I've had, you know, I've had investors even, you know, that have mentioned, well, I got this deal from the sponsor I've been working with for a, a long time, but then all of a sudden 
you know, I got this, the same deal from this other guy I just briefly met at this conference, you know, and, and then they're trying to figure out, well, what's going on here? Well, you know, what, what is happening? And, and I think it's leading even, our, you know, are the LPs, the passive investors to, to really investigate what's happening here and, who, you know, who's actually doing the deal? Yeah, I think, I think LPs are definitely starting to get educated and get smarter and figure out what their rights are in all of this. So, um, so very, very briefly, and I, I don't want to go into the legalese too much, but, um, you know, the general rule of thumb for any capital raiser, which by the by the way, is it a ter- is a terrible term for this role, right? Um, Wait, I have tr- I have tried to delete that out of my vocabulary, but it's it's <laughs> difficult. Like we've all been using that term for so long, but it's like my partner and I try to like eh, try to, you know <laughs> cut that out every time we say that. It's like hello SEC, come look at me. Um, so you know what everyone in this industry calls a capital raiser is really what we call a broker dealer, right? So. I'm going to just read for a second. So the federal activity-based definition of broker in Section 384 of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 is, it's very straightforward, right? So this is literally the definition, broker. The term broker means any person engaged in the business of affecting transactions in securities for the account of others. So there's two really important parts of this definition. One is engaged in the business, right? And the second is affecting transactions. Both those terms are very, very broadly interpreted by the SEC. So it's pretty difficult to argue generally that a lot of these capital raisers are not engaged in the business when their activities are very directly related to capital raising and they are receiving compensation for those activities. Um, There's a a very short clip of uh, a speech that one of the commissioners of the the SEC uh, gave. And I just want to read that to you guys real quick because I think if, if you hear this, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of red flags that go off in your mind. So, you know, generally, if you want to raise capital for others and be paid transaction-based compensation, um, you have to be a broker-dealer. So this is, this is what that speech said. The test for broker-dealer registration is broad and depends on various activities a person performs in one or more securities transactions. For example, um, some factors... Uh, for some example of activities or factors that might require um, registration as a broker dealer include marketing securities to investors, soliciting or negotiating securities transactions, or handling customer funds and securities. And this is the most important part of the speech. The importance of each of these activities is heightened when there is also compensation that depends on the outcome or size of the securities transaction. In other words, transaction-based compensation, also referred to as, quote unquote, a salesman's stake in securities transaction. The SEC and SEC staff have long viewed receipt of transaction-based compensation as a hallmark of being a broker. This makes sense to me as the broker regulatory structure is built, at least in large part, around managing the conflict of interest arising from a broker acting as a security salesman as compared to an investment advisor, which traditionally acts as a fiduciary and which should not have that type of conflict of interest. Okay, so transaction-based compensation and really the way the industry thinks that they're getting around all of this is that there's something called the 3A4-1 issuer exemption, which basically states that, hey, if you are an officer or director of the issuer of the security, in, in, this, in, in this industry, that would mean the sponsor or, or the managing entity, right? Then it is okay to, be, to, to go market these securities and be paid transaction-based compensation. That's true, there is an issuer exemption. The way people are dealing with this issuer exemption is um, not kosher. Um, so I, I talked earlier about uh, this whole deferred equity structure. And let me explain very quickly what that generally looks like. So 
um, the sponsor will go to the capital raisers and say, hey, you're going to be part of the GP. So you're going to be part of the issuer. And thus you could be paid transaction-based compensation for raising capital and everything's fine. And then sometimes they will have um, a separate agreement with the capital raiser that says, okay, and as compensation for other services like investor relations, um, your slice of the GP is going to be dependent on how much capital you bring to the table. In some cases, there's even an algorithm <laughs> of exactly how, how much uh, of the GP they get. So you bring in a million dollars, well, that's you know, one fourth of um, the overall raise. So you get exactly this much, right? That is like the definition of transaction-based compensation. Remember that these terms are broadly construed, which means it, it, it's not just money. So you can get cash, that's compensation. You can get fiat, you can get Bitcoin, you can get equity. Um, many things count as compensation. It doesn't matter if it's cash from the acquisition fee, cash from the asset management fee, cash from whatever fee, that's all compensation. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, the point I wanna make is um, if you are not in the PPM <laughs> and you are not in the investor deck and you are like one of these dozens of capital raisers who, you know, you maybe signed this agreement and they, they shuffle you into this LLC and that LLC is named on the PPM, but the, the people behind it or not, um, that's problematic, right, for, for a number of reasons. You may be thinking, well, you know, but, but that's not the case because I'm part of the GP, and, but you're not, right? Because if you raise zero dollars, you are not part of the GP. This, mm. this deferred equity structure thing is, um, is, it's pretty laughable to me <laughs> because it's clearly just, I think, an attempt to get around the rules, uh, a very unsuccessful attempt. And, um, you know, Whitney, you and I were talking yesterday, but uh, the rule of thumb, I think, in not just this area of law, but many areas of law, especially securities laws, because people are always trying to get around securities laws, is if it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, and it swims like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? If you are going head over heels, trying to create crazy complex loopholes so that you can get around the broker-dealer rule, it doesn't matter what form it takes. There's no algorithm, there's no formula, there's no like, you know, if I do this, then it will not, it, it you know, we're not paying transaction-based compensation. You don't have to register as a broker dealer. It is simply, you know, if it looks like transaction-based compensation, if it looks like you're doing broker dealer activities, you're probably doing broker dealer activities. And a minute ago, you mentioned, you know, if you're if you do not raise any money, then you're not going to be paid anything. I mean, that right there seems like a pretty easy way to just figure out if you're doing this properly or not. Um, you know, are you going to be paid? if you do not bring any capital to the deal. Yeah, definitely. Um, and if you are going to be paid something, regardless of whether you bring um, investors to the deal, then that's a different question, right? Um, there, I think there are ways of doing that, but at the same time, the, the devil's in the details because a lot of it is about how you do it. Um, I think in the past, and, and I want to say that the real estate syndication industry is not alone, right? Um, I think in many different industries right now, people are becoming increasingly creative around this restriction. And, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point where even last week, um, there was a thread on the ABA, the, the American Bar Association, where a lot of securities attorneys were, were talking about the crazy structures that we're seeing. There was one specific instance people talked about in which case 
the issuer, which it was not a real estate company. I think it was probably a tech company. They were like, well, we are going to gift some equity um, to this capital raiser and their job is going to be making introductions and structuring the raise and fundraising and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and they're going to get that capital no matter what, but their logic was, well, the success of the company is dependent on whether or not we raise. So if we are able to raise, then afterwards, um, you know, that, that particular deal included a buyback option. So the way they were going to compensate the capital raiser was, okay, well, if we raise, we will buy, we'll buy back our equity. You will end up getting cash. And that's how you are uh, going to get paid. And pretty much every single attorney on the thread was like, nope, this is illegal. And not only is it legal, <laughs> there's other things you have to think about too. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about for one second, if you are a capital raiser, if you sign one of these agreements, the agreement in, in the vast majority of states is not going to be any good. The agreement will mm. be void, right? You will not be owed anything. And the reason why you would not be owed anything is because there's a general concept in law where basically if you do anything illegal, so um, you, you make some, you know, agreement that is in violation of federal and state laws um, that are deemed against public policy, um, they are basically unenforceable, right? Um, and not only that, the unlawful sale gives investors rescission rights against the issuer. So rescission basically means at any time during the deal, investors are entitled to all their money back. That plus certain states have other laws um, that you should be aware of, right? So for example, California has a very draconian law, the investor can actually require the unregistered broker, so the capital raiser, to repurchase the unlawfully sold securities. So you, the capital raiser, if you get a complaint from an investor, you have to pony up the cash to buy back all those securities from that investor. So if you wow. raise a lot, <laughs> you're going to have to buy back a lot. Um, I also want to talk very quickly about how the courts view this activity because whenever um, you're dealing with securities laws, right, you have a regulatory, okay, actually, there's three things to think about. Um, you have the SEC, which is the federal regulatory agency. Then you have state regulators and different states work different ways, right? For example, Maryland is very aggressive because their version of their state SEC falls under the attorney general's office. So they're, they tend to be one of the more aggressive states. And then you have something that we call the plaintiff's bar, right? Um, so there's many different types of lawyers. There's transactional attorneys, which I am, um, which they help you do your deal, right? But they don't go to court. There are litigation attorneys where all they do is sue people all day long or defend their clients all day long and they go to court. Of the litigation attorneys, there's two flavors. One, um, one type of litigation attorney is the type of person who generally defends a client, you know, usually corporations or things of that sort. And the other type is what we call the plaintiff's bar. The plaintiff's bar is exactly what it sounds like. It's the people who go and help someone sue, right? There are some plaintiff's bar attorneys who do not take fees up front. They take contingency fees, which means that they get paid only if they recover something from the case. Typically, they're very motivated. <laughs> so they're so like, and, and I used to explain this to people back in like the ICO days. Um, if you get in a letter from the SEC, like the SEC, it's a civil servant, probably someone who lives in Washington, D.C. or one of the regional offices. They go to work nine to five. They're trying to do their public duty. Um, they're not malicious people. They're just trying to enforce the law and do what they think is right. If you cooperate, generally your life is not going to go down the gutter. 
the plaintiff's bar is another breed of personality. <laughs> they, um, they're not bad people, right? It's just that they, they tend to have a bulldog personality. And uh, if you cooperate with them, it will not make your life easier. <laughs> um, they're never going to walk away until they get their money because they've already invested work, right? Typically, you're looking at something like a 25, 30 percent contingency fee. So they are motivated to recover as much as possible for their client because that's how they get paid. Um, furthermore, if you take it to a court, um, while the court might look at the actual capital raising activities more closely than the SEC might, the SEC could not be clearer in its enforcement position, in, it, in its enforcement position and defending an enforcement action through the court appellate process um, to get a court's review of the facts and circumstances of a case. And this usually takes years and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of attorney fees to reach a conclusion. Um, and without any assurance of the outcome, trust me, the SEC is very highly motivated to defend its long held position in court about what are broker dealer activities. Okay. Um, so that's all one topic. The other topic I wanted to say, <laughs> there's, there's so much to talk about with this topic. There's so many ways to, um, to, to divide and conquer it. Um, some folks think that, well, it's okay because the offering is in this state and I'm just gonna go to investors in this state. And so they think what they're dealing with is what we call an intrastate offering, right? So you're only dealing with people in one state and thus it, it, you know, you fall under a state exemption, not a federal exemption. Generally, that is correct, except for the fact that <laughs> You know, every state has their own broker dealer exemptions. A lot of them also take a very broad view of all these types of broker dealer activities. Um, the definition of a broker dealer or a dealer tracks, tends to track very, very closely with the federal definition. Um, there are a few states with narrow exemptions for finders, um, and they, but they also impose conditions on their exemptions for state, you know, finder filings or, or finder fees. Um, states are more likely to identify and take enforcement actions than the SEC because they're closer to the investor, right? Um, and, you know, they are also very highly voted, motivated to defend their position on what constitutes a broker-doer. So, if you're relying on an interstate exemption, know that state laws exist as well. That's a lot to digest, that's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it, it's great information though, but you know, you mentioned very early on about, uh, you know, they were, uh, they were not doing it the way then that we are today. And I just wondered, like, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What's, you know, what's changed this and what, or, or where do you see this going? And so, um, the way people were doing this before this recent explosion looked a lot more like they were actually part of the GP, like they were actually a part of the sponsor, right? So even though one of their duties was raising capital, it was not their sole duty. And they didn't just tack on, oh, you're going to raise capital and do investor relations. I, I, I had a client ask me a couple weeks ago, okay, so if I engage one of these capital raisers um, and I have them also do investor relations, is that okay? Is that enough? And I was like, no. Like, as an attorney, I will never tell you that's okay or, or that's enough. You want them to be truly a part of the sponsor. You're, they're not just relegated to this like one little thing that they do. And then for the next five to seven year hold period of the project, they, 
sit on their butts, right? No, they have to actually be engaged. So typically what these um, deals used to look like was, you know, there, there, were, there were documents, the PPM, the investor deck, where these people were named as part of the sponsor. These people would get a slice of the GP, um, but it was not determined by some algorithm. It was like, okay, we're going to give you 5%, we're going to give you 10%, whatever. Um, if that person brought in $0, then that person brought in $0, but that's it. Like, you're, you're not going to take that slice of the GP away from them. They had many other duties aside from raising capital or investor relations, right? Maybe it's interfacing with the CPA, helping get K-1s issued. Maybe it's um, dealing with legal. Maybe it's helping due diligence to the property. Maybe it's coordinating with the property management. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of things. There's so many things you could do as part of the sponsor, right? Um, other than just raising capital. So while I'm reluctant to say what I just described is a foolproof way of being able to do business as a capital raiser, um, it, it comes back down to my duck analogy, right? If I were to take a step back, you know, as the reasonable person, if I'm, if I'm going to go sit on a jury and I have no experience with investments or capital raising or anything like that, and I had to sit in court and listen to um, people describe their activities as a, as a capital raiser, and someone then told me the definition of a broker dealer and, and how to interpret it. Would I, as the reasonable person, think this sounds more like a capital raising scheme? Or would I think, hey, it sounds like they're truly a part of this general partnership. And that's what it comes down to. There is no magical voting structure, right? There's no magical like, okay, well, if you do this, this, and this duty, you're good, right? It's, you, you have, unfortunately, you have to look at the facts and circumstances. There's not like a, a number of capital raisers. There's not like a, you know, uh, yeah, how much or of anything. It's, it's really using some common sense, it seems like, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. making sure that, you know, when you're part of the general partnership, that it's, if your only duty is to raise capital, then there, there may be a problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and there's definitely a risk towards having more people as GPs in the deal as opposed to having fewer but that's an entirely different topic in and of itself that I'm hoping to cover on the next show. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We don't have a whole lot of time left, uh, but that would be great <laughs> to talk about that as well. Cause I know this topic is, is extremely talked about right now. So, um, you know, Amy, uh, you know, we are about out of time and, and, but anything else you want to leave us with on this topic that I, like I said, you know, you and I did talk yesterday and we both talked about how many calls, you know, we're getting about this specific topic and, and, uh, but anything else you want to leave us with before, before we have to go? Um, you know, if you don't listen to the next episode that you do, I just want to leave you with this, which is the people that you partner with, uh, in business, it, especially in the securities industry, is incredibly important. And, you know, we don't have time to go into that topic today. Um, but, you know, I'll just, I'll just leave you with that. Okay. Because that, and that can, and, and I'll say that can haunt you forever, right? I mean, the people you're yes. partnering with today, and if somebody else makes a mistake, it can affect you throughout your syndication career. Exactly. So, yeah. All right, Amy, thank you so much. And, uh, uh, but before we go, uh, tell people how, uh, how do you like to give back? Oh, uh, to give back. Wow. <laughs> um, somehow I feel like I end up doing a lot of like free legal work, not in the real estate syndication space, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really only good in, in my area of law specifically, but I, I feel like I'm like a, a Rolodex for people who are trying to find different types of attorneys. And I'm generally pretty good at tracking down, um, attorneys who work on very specific things. I love working with specialists, not generalists. So I, I do spend a lot of time doing that these days. 
Nice. Okay. Well, I know you've helped me a lot and you're helping the listeners a lot as well. And we are very grateful for your time. And uh, But tell them how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, sure. Um, the best way to get in touch with me these days is just go on my website and request a consultation. It's um, bootstraplegal.com. You can also email me at amy at bootstraplegal.com. I don't use LinkedIn or Twitter or the other social media so much these days because I'm just getting a lot of spam. So, yeah. All right. Thank you again, Amy. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.